Enzymes are really cool molecules which help in catalyzing metabolic functions in the body. They act as biocatalysts and most of these enzymes are proteins in their tertiary level of structure formation. So therefore, the activity of an enzyme can be affected by any factors that can alter the tertiary structure of a protein. In this video, we will be looking at four main factors which can affect the enzyme activity. The first two factors, temperature and pH, affect proteins in a very similar manner. Both these physical factors can disrupt the tertiary structure of a protein and therefore they can disrupt enzyme functioning as well. If we were to visualize the effect of temperature and pressure through a graph, this is how it would look like. So I would have the enzyme activity on the y-axis uh, and the physical factors on the x-axis. So in one case it's temperature and in the other case it's pH. Let's look at the enzyme activity of two different enzymes. The first one is pepsin and the second is TAC polymerase. Similarly, to study the pH, we would use pepsin and trypsin. What you're noticing here is that all the four graphs look the same. That is because enzymes work in a narrow range of temperature and pH. But there is one singular temperature or pH where enzyme shows its maximum activity that we call as optimum temperature or optimum pH. So what do I mean by that? We have plotted the function of pepsin over temperature ranges roughly between um, 15 degrees and 55 degrees. We notice that the graph increases to a certain point and then the activity decreases again. So roughly around 37 degrees, pepsin shows the highest activity. It makes sense because pepsin is designed to function at our body temperature. It's a digestive enzyme. But at the same time, look at TAC polymerase, which has its maximum activity somewhere between 70 and 80. We could say 78 degrees. That's because this enzyme is quite special. It comes from a bacteria which lives in extreme temperature conditions that allows for the enzymes in its body to work at extreme temperatures. Nonetheless, you notice that outside this particular temperature range, the function of the enzyme reduces. The same thing is seen in case of pH as well. Pepsin it works in acidic pH, whereas trypsin works in alkaline pH. Trypsin is part of your pancreatic enzymes. Pepsin shows maximum activity between 1 to 2 pH, whereas trypsin shows maximum activity around 8 to 9 pH. So why does this happen? Lower temperatures lower the enzyme activity, whereas higher temperatures can denature the enzymes. In the same way, different pH can change the properties of the individual amino acids in the enzyme, which will lead to overall change in its structure. When the structure changes, the function also changes. The next factor to look at is substrate concentration. So let's imagine in a cell, we have about 10 molecules of an enzyme and 100 molecules of a substrate. This is usually the physiological state because there are very few enzyme molecules compared to the substrate. So the substrates react with the enzyme uh, in order to form product. And you notice that the time the 10 product molecules are formed, the enzymes are immediately engaging with a new set of 10 substrate molecules. And this continues until all the substrates are converted to product. And as more and more enzymes and substrate molecules interact with each other, the speed of the reaction increases. If I were to visualize this particular reaction, the y-axis would represent the velocity of the reaction, the x-axis represents the substrate concentration. So as the number of uh, enzyme and substrate molecules interact, the speed of the reaction increases. So that is represented by this exponentially extending curve. Now, if this trend were to continue, you would look at a graph like this. But we notice that as the reaction proceeds, this is what the graph looks like. We see that the velocity of the reaction increases a bit more and it reaches a range after which it doesn't increase at all. It just plateaus in the same level. The reason we see this particular trend is because the amount of enzyme molecules are limited. And we notice that as the reaction proceeds, there is not even a single moment where the enzyme molecules are left free. Because once the product is formed, that active site is immediately replaced by a new substrate. Thus, at one point, the reaction ultimately reaches its maximum velocity, which we call as Vmax. This represents the theoretical upper limit of the speed of the particular enzyme. So, Vmax represents the maximum speed at which the enzyme can operate. But to achieve Vmax, we need excess of substrate. 
So when you're studying a cell and you realize a certain metabolic pathway is slow, you can compare that speed with the actual speed of the enzyme. And then you can figure out whether the problem is insufficient enzymes, insufficient substrate or something else. Max is also an indication of how well the reaction is proceeding. In a cell, we don't find enzymes always working at their maximum ability. Imagine driving a car at its maximum speed all the time. We would not want to do that, right? The reason is because it's very difficult to control something that's going at a very high speed. Most enzymes in the living cells operate near half of the maximum velocity of the enzymes. Now, this can be used to find a constant which is called as Km. Km is important because it represents the physiological substrate concentration. Substrate concentration. What it means is that in a cell, that would be the concentration of a certain uh, substrate realistically. Km represents the enzyme substrate affinity and it is inversely proportional to the affinity. So when Km is low, there is more affinity between enzyme and the substrate. And when Km is high, the affinity is lower. So the two takeaways are that Vmax represents the quality of the reaction, how good the enzyme reaction is proceeding. Km represents the affinity between the enzyme and the substrate. How does this help us understand uh, physiological reactions in our body? Let's take one single example. Although Km primarily represents the affinity between enzyme and substrates, it can also be used to study how a protein and a certain ion interacts with each other. So something like in a transport channel. We have a specific uh, transport channel called as the glucose transporter, which helps the glucose molecules to enter into the cell. In short, it is called as the glute transporter and there are different types of glute transporters depending upon the organ that you are looking at. We will focus on the glute transporters 1 and 3 present on the neurons or we could say in brain and the glute transporter 2 which is mostly present in liver and pancreas. Now comparing how these two work, the glute transporter in the brain has low Km. We know low Km means high affinity. So what it means in real time is that these glucose transporters take up glucose very efficiently even if the overall glucose amount present in the body is less. It makes sense to do that because a uh, brain needs a lot of energy even when it is not uh, actively in use. So even when we are in a state of fast, all of the glucose will be taken to the brain. Now the glute that is present in the liver, it has very high Km and we know high Km means low affinity. What that means in physiology is that it takes up glucose only when glucose is high in the blood. So something like after a meal. So which means this particular transporter uses glucose only when glucose is present in excess. Therefore, by having two different Km levels for two different proteins, the body is able to create these subtle differences in how they function. It also helps them to regulate the biochemical reactions better. Addition of specific chemicals to the reaction can also affect how the enzymes function. These chemicals are called as inhibitors and the reaction is called as enzyme inhibition. Depending on whether we can reverse the inhibition or not, we have two types of enzyme inhibition reaction. We have competitive inhibition and non-competitive inhibition. In competitive inhibition, we have an enzyme which has its own active site and the substrate is designed in a way that it fits into the active site. But there is an additional molecule which is inhibitor that competes with the substrate to bind to the active site. That's because the binding area is very similar to that of the substrate. So sometimes the substrate can bind to the enzyme, but sometimes the inhibitor can bind to the enzyme. This graph represents the velocity of a reaction when there is no inhibitor present. But in competitive inhibition, this is how the graph looks like. We see both the curves have the same Vmax, but if we were to plot the Km, we can see that there is a slight difference. So Vmax of the curve where there is enzyme inhibition is similar to the Vmax when the reaction is uninhibited, meaning the quality of the reaction is maintained. But the Km value of the inhibited reaction is more than the Km value of the uninhibited reaction, which means that the binding quality of enzyme and substrate is lowered. So overall, this leads to a slow reaction. So what happens is when the inhibitor binds to the enzyme, it slows down the rate of reaction. But competitive inhibitions are usually reversible. So how do we do that? If we increase the concentration of substrate with respect to inhibitor, it would reverse the reaction. An example of this sort of competitive inhibition is when the enzyme succinic dehydrogenase is 
inhibited by the molecule malonate. So, in TCA cycle, succinic dehydrogenase catalyzes the conversion of succinate to fumarate. You can see that both these molecules share similar binding sites with that of the enzyme and therefore can competitively inhibit each other in the reaction. In non competitive inhibition, we have an enzyme with the substrate which can bind to its active site. But in addition to the active site, there is a new site called as the allosteric site. And inhibitors usually bind in the allosteric site. So, substrate bind to active site, inhibitor binds to the allosteric site. So, if we were to plot a non competitive inhibition reaction, this is what the graph would look like. We can see that the Vmax value has reduced, but the Km value remains the same. When the Km value of inhibited and uninhibited reactions are the same, it means there is no issues of binding between enzyme and substrate. But Vmax of inhibited reaction is much lower than the Vmax of uninhibited reaction, which means that the reaction quality is very poor. So what can we conclude from this? So looking at the Km and Vmax values, we know that although the substrate was able to successfully bind to the enzyme, somehow catalysis is what's not able to happen. That is because when non-competitive inhibitors bind to the enzyme, they change few parts of the active site which are responsible for catalysis. And because the inhibitors cannot be pushed out of the enzyme molecule, these reactions are usually irreversible. An example of non-competitive inhibition is cyanide poisoning. So what cyanide does is it irreversibly binds to the cytochrome oxidase enzyme present within mitochondria and it stops the ATP production in the cell. So although there are no issues with binding, the inhibitor changes the catalytic properties of the active site.